The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth, where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. Offer your clients flexibility, transparency, and efficiency with managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantitis and the guest joining me here to deep dive into Suitability Hub originally thought that engineering was his calling, which is interesting, until he accidentally tripped into a Derivatives 101 class. Separate story for later, I'm sure, folks. And this sort of set in motion a great love of finance and statistics and all things, you know, money and economics. And so became an associate financial advisor before then diving into the research side of our industry and eventually running the research arm of investment trends. But then about three years ago, became the founder of the app we are here to talk about today. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Reject back Welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me on today, Peter. Lovely You're to be here. You're very welcome. Now, we're going to dive in to this wonderful tool that you have built. But first, I'd love to take a moment to ease us in and get to know you through your use of technology. What is your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? Yes. Yes. As a um, <laughs> millennial, emojis is a key part of my life. And I would say the most used one is the muscle emoji. So oh, nice. um, th- that's the one where it's the, the bicep, the, up arm with the yeah, bicep. Nice. And I, I just really like it because it has many meanings. Like It's like sending someone strength or encouraging yep. them or wishing them on and, you know, you can do it. And uh, it's just a nice, positive emoji. That's that's yeah, why I, I use like it, it. Uh, the most. I like it. Well, and now forever now we'll think of you doing a <laughs> <laughs> the muscle emoji. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Now we all, God, oh, we all live with these smartphones, don't we? And they're just, well, some of them are permanently attached to people on watches even. If you had to get rid of all of the apps on your smartphone and just keep three, which three would you keep? Gosh, so uh, I have two <laughs> that I would keep. <laughs> nice. Maybe not. Maybe not three. Uh, the number one is kind of linked to the emoji as well. Now that I think about it, but uh, I do enjoy going to the gym and working out. However, okay. I also find it very boring. <laughs> so Mate. I I always have to have something to listen to. So primarily, yep. uh, the Economist. You know, I listen to, which is a weekly magazine. Yep. So throughout yep. the week in my training sessions. And when I'm done with that, I'll move on to podcasts and listen to that. So train your body while you train your mind. Nice. Um, and then the other app is one called Toady. And uh, I am a process and task-driven person overall. And so is my wife. And this app is actually really great. Like you go in, you put in all your chores at home. Mm-hmm. And then when one person completes it, it gets assigned to the next person so if i do something my wife will have to do it next and then i'll do it next and well there's um uh, some kpis you have to meet as well like certain things have to be done daily or weekly or monthly so we have a a bit of a gamification of how we do chores at home and uh, I, i would say this app falls in the 
marriage saver category for anyone who, <laughs> who wants uh, a stronger relationship with their spouse. Uh, worth spending any amount on an app such as, this, such as that, <laughs> I would say. So is that as in Toady as in, as in Toad, T-O-A-D-Y? T-O-D-Y. T-O-D-Y. I am going to check that out. That's I love it when people like bring tidy, up It's like Tidy, but to do, with, you know, yeah, it's, it's okay. a good pun now that I think about it. Yeah. Very good yeah. App. Perfect. Oh, on that case, for sure. Um, although I have to ask before we <laughs> dive in, if you're you clearly are a listener while you're working out, do you ever like have a moment of like either exclaiming about something or laughing at something or anything like like I've done that at the gym where I'm so absorbed in what I'm listening to that I react v- vocally to it and then realize I'm surrounded by a whole lot of people that it, aren't listening it, to what I'm listening to. It's one of the more embarrassing things that can happen. It happens right? all the time. <sighs> Um, the worst is uh, where you just can't hold back your laughter when you're doing yeah. some heavy weights. And <laughs> it's, oh my God, someone come save me. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it's <laughs> it's good. I think there's a lot of other people in, in a similar boat. So you know, yeah. everyone's in their own bubble and uh, you don't have to feel too self-conscious. No, no, not at all. All right. So let's dive into Suitability Hub, shall we? So to give the listener a sense, because this is sort of very new, they may have, people are listening, may have vaguely seen, maybe seen you, you've done some work with um, major players in the industry, and so they may have seen you at conferences and things like that, but they might not have heard of the tools. So to get us started at a really high level, where does Suitability Hub sit in the advice tech space? What category sort of does it sit under? Who might it sort of be lined up next to, for example? Yep, yep. So it's a very much a pure research play. Uh, it's designed for uh, advisors and uh, other professionals in our industry who want to understand which products are the most suitable for their yep. business and their clients. So we uh, are very focused on just doing that research piece really, really well so that you can go in and understand financial products. Yeah, okay. And I'm curious then, so it's it's sort of – it's fairly recent, isn't it? So did you start this sort of around 2021? Am I right? Is yes. So 2021 yeah. is when we started. Uh, I used to do a lot of research into the wealth management space, but this was more for institutional clients back in right. my uh, old role at Investment Trends. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things, though, that I've always been passionate about is financial advice. Like I used to work as an associate advisor. I've seen the power uh, that financial advice can have on like the impact it can have on people's livelihoods. Mm. And I just wanted to build something that the everyday advisor can use as well as part of the research process. Because yeah. at the end of the day, like if we help get good advice to as many people as possible, then we just help, you know, make Australia a better outcomes for Australians as a whole and B make the whole financial planning community a better place to work. So the this I suppose the like why behind like why we came up with the product was mm. to enable advisors to deliver their best advice. And as you know, one of the uh, key challenges that most advisors have is around compliance burden. And <laughs> if you dig into this uh, you, you know, you can you can confirm it if you wish, but <laughs> if you dig into this, uh, often they'll say it's about demonstrating that I'm acting in the best interest of my clients. That's right. where the hardest effort is. So we, our software, we designed it as an evidence-based decision-making tool right. so that advisors can justify um, uh, or clearly uh, show how they decided that a particular product was the most suitable for their customer. Yeah, and it's, and it's an interesting dis- or an important distinction, isn't it, between the doing the right thing by the client and providing clear steps and outline of of what or like how you know. So being able to go back to that and clearly show, well, this is why it's the best things, you know. The, yeah, and, yeah. and it is in our heads. I think often we blur that, you know. That's it's like, exactly. No, I know it was the best thing. Yeah, but what if somebody came to this cold? How could they look at something and go, "Oh, I agree. That's clearly the best thing," you know. <laughs> It, exactly. You're spot on there. So one of the key things that we do is leave an audit trail so that as advisors work through the research process, um, there are multiple steps where they can leave evidence around what did they consider, uh, why they made certain decisions, why they made uh, you know decisions not to use particular things. So yeah. that if someone ever comes in 12 months time or three years time or 10 years time and questions, why, why did you do this advice? Uh, there's a compliance trail that they've left saying, okay, this was the whole decision-making process. 
And it is so interesting in, so let, you know, let's talk, say, platforms. If we were having this conversation a decade ago, then what's interesting about that is there was such blinding differences, to be honest. Like it was the the platforms or the potential places people's money could live (laughs) were so different and the pricing was so different that in fact, almost the evidence, it wasn't that it was easier, but it was just more blatantly obvious. Whereas I think now as the products, and I, I, I am curious if you agree, as they get much closer, you know, they're sort of all getting, when you line them up, you've got to dig deeper to really get to the differences because they're all starting to look a lot similar. Then of course, I mean, that's not bad because it means probably it's getting more competitive and, you know, they're all tightening their pencils when they're doing pricing. But what it also means for advisors is we've got to be able to dig deeper to then provide, well, which ones do we think are the right one for that client? So I'm, I'm betting part of that is why something like Suitability Hub becomes necessary because we've got to go deeper. We've got to look more under the hood. Yeah, yeah. Actually, so when you look at um, Best in Duty, let's take that for a second, the industry as a whole, so licensees, advisors, there's a trend towards them placing fairly heavy emphasis on fees and their mm. product selection decisions, especially when it comes to platform providers. Right. But part of the reason behind this is that they don't have access to tools that let them go beyond fees. Right. Whereas, <laughs> as you were explaining, like some of the propositions have become so rich, uh, so nuanced that actually your product decision can have a huge impact on the client's outcomes when going uh, and look, like, uh, looking at the features and capabilities yeah. that they get access to. So yeah. fees is only part of the picture. Mm. And as part of our research tool, um, we, we have this belief that if you know, providers only compete on fees, it's a race to the bottom and that's not necessarily good at the end of the day for the end customers because you don't want to have the custodian of your money going going under, right? right. So, um, uh, yeah, so what we do is like we bring that feature analysis lens to product selection so advisors can go in there. They can assess platforms based on which will be most, uh, which have the right features, number one, um, to meet the needs of their clients, but number uh, to to enable them to run their businesses they want to run it because everyone right. has their own value proposition they care about having access to certain different functionality based on the proposition that they're delivering yeah. to their clients yeah and I do think also yes. that um the public I think in general probably have a view of what is possible on any of these platforms far beyond what is so as a rule like they're like what do you mean I can't just do this? What do you mean I can't just like to them? They're used to dealing with an Amazon instant buy or, you know, like, like their world is Uber Eats instant delivery. Like the, all <laughs> these things happen now. And, you know, if I was to describe an expression for our, you know, financial institutions, it's not about it happening now. Like that's not the expression you'd use. It takes time. So, so I, I agree. I think um, part of the discovery process, and we do this a lot now with clients is, is what is important to them? What's going to drive them nuts? Like what are the mm-hmm. things that are just bare minimums for them? It's got to be like this or, you know, you, your hours are like this, therefore they could never call in or whatever the nuances are for them because then you can actually match. And for some clients, you might put two up and you'll go, look, this one is cheaper, but you you said you needed these things. It's just a bit more, you know, it's going to cost a little more. And, and frequently the client's like, I'm good with that. I, I just need it to have these features, you know. Um, yeah, and I, actually – what you said around the Uber Eats piece is actually like very relevant at the moment because platforms as a whole, like they do a really good job administering client investments, mm. reporting, you know, helping save advisors time. But there's uh, still room to grow from the yeah. perspective of digitizing advisor instructions and also enabling better tracking. So yes. now if you think about most of our experiences, you hop on Uber Eats, you order something, you can track it in real time. Where is it up to? Whereas on platforms, until quite recently, that tracking capability was uh, not quite there. Uh, there was a big innovation from BT Panorama at the end of 2022, where they said, all right, now you have a work tracker where you can actually see the estimated completion time. So they look right. at the last seven-day rolling average of how long something takes to deliver, and then they yeah. sh- show that to the advisor. And the rest of the platform industries been playing catch up with that. So if you're an advisor who cares about that sort of workflow tracking, 
or having a lot of straight through processing capability, you can hop onto Suitability Hub. You can say, I need these things because it will help me reduce the costs of serving a client. Yeah. And you'll find like when it comes to um, uh, straight through processing, like North is actually number one in the market as a platform. Okay. Um, when it comes to workflow tracking, Hub24 does really well, BT Panorama does really well. So depending on like what are the things you care about, right. you will get very different outcomes from the, the platforms out there. But how wonderful that you can then be quite um, detailed and nuanced with that in the advice. What I like is to be able to say some of these things are to match your values, some are to match the way we work. Here's an alternative, and and that, but that's not going to match this for you, and it won't. But you know, like I think, um, whereas previously, I mean, some of us would have our own spreadsheets con- trying to keep track of the the little elements and features and things. I mean, even just access via online or apps, you know, that was that's a nuanced thing. That's not just blindingly obvious. They're all very different in the way they do that. Um, you know, who has you know what factor authentication, what you know, do they need original wet signatures or not? Like there's all sorts of things, you know, that that are quite different and so i think having the power to go somewhere where that's being maintained and being able to search on that basis and then demonstrate that um has some real power the other element i did want to chat about though and when you and i first discuss um discuss the suitability hub i got quite excited about this <laughs> yes i'm going to geek out listeners just you know hold on um is you know, ESG is a is a increasingly um, interesting prospect for consumers, uh, and more and more of them are showing interest well beyond the demographics that we all thought would. Um, it isn't just uh, millennials and all the letters, you know, <laughs> younger than that. <laughs> um, there's lots of people in all of the other demographics that are that are interested. And and as we were chatting about that fact, then it becomes more than just where the underlying fund and what they're doing with their money. These people are going to care about the platform and their credentials in that sense. So talk us through, uh, you know, how Suitability Hub is, is, you know, sort of trying to keep on top of that so that then, you know, the end client, you can sort of give them insights at both levels, both maybe the investments you might recommend, but also the platform they're sitting on. Yeah, yeah. So when we were doing the research and interviews with advisors ahead of building suitability, we we talked to them about all sorts of things like uh, what are their unmet needs in the business? What is it that their clients are asking them that they're not able to deliver? And what became apparent is that for some advisors, there's a big emphasis on that ESG side of things. So that Mm. demand is coming from their client or it's part of the value proposition. And what they were saying was, Recep, you know what? There's a lot of research around the stocks within funds and their ESG credentials, but what we're having is more clients coming to us and saying, what about the ESG credentials of the fund manager itself? What about the ESG credentials of the platform provider itself? And we incorporated that lens to our research. And it was a very interesting process because the, our data comes from platform providers and uh, we went and asked them uh, for these things. And for some of them, it was actually a challenge to find oh, what were, what are our <laughs> ESG policies in this area and what are the things we do. But we have a fairly uh, expansive set of criteria that platforms can be compared on when it comes to their ESG credentials, including mm. Gender composition, uh, composition uh, on the board and the executive leadership team, um, uh, uh, targets around uh, getting to zero emissions or um, policies around reducing scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. So quite a few different criteria. Mm. And our research is driven by uh, the feedback we get from financial advisors. So right. in the beginning, when we first launched uh, and we did our uh, beta with financial advisors. We had about 15 different areas we were uh, researching around the whole ESG criteria. And then, mm. uh, you know, we had, does the platform have a commitment to reduce scope one and scope two emission? So they looked at that and they said, Richard, this is all well and good, but what about scope three emissions? So uh, <laughs> we've added a lot more since then. I think we're getting close to about 30 different criteria there. And this is Uh, One of the uniques of our proposition, I'm not aware of any other solution where you can go in and actually look at the platform provider itself and what are their uh, credentials in the space. Because once again, I think um, 
that's one of those things that probably the end consumer automatically thinks we're allowing for because to them where their money is is just where their money is if you get what i mean like to them i think if if we've bothered to engage with them on on those sort of values and we've drawn it out of them and then we've picked a portfolio it probably wouldn't necessarily occur to them that they needed to ask but what about where the money's sitting do you know what I mean like mm-hmm. i they, there's probably an assumption there that we've thought of that too do you know what i mean so i think i love that this is now a possibility because uh, it's valid. It's valid to check the layers, you know, and if it's if it's important to somebody, then at least having some insight into the difference so that then they're at least more informed, you know. And like you say, it'll come down to how much information you can get, of course, mm-hmm. but, but um, you know, it's certainly a start. And what I love too is things that are measured can change. And so the minute more people are using tools like yours that are then asking those questions, then more of them will feel accountable on all of those initiatives and might actually make more headway. So, I, you know, I think it's, um, it's well worth uh, incorporating. So in terms of then the user, so the, as in the advisor or mm-hmm. the practice, then are you seeing this, you know, is predominantly the advisor themselves or maybe the power planner using the tool? Uh, is there any other ways you see other members of the team interacting with the tool going forward? Yeah, it's actually been quite mixed. So the way our tool is designed is that, uh, you know, everyone runs their businesses differently mm-hmm. and we don't want to be prescriptive in how you uh, you run your research and who does the research and so on. So what we've seen is uh, the whole chain is using it. We have um, some uh, licensee managers or compliance folks who use it to just say, okay, like uh, this helps us validate uh, or research the platforms that we have on our APL. Okay. Um, advisors use it and practices are uh, quite different, like in size and scope. So depending on the type of practice, the users change as well. So yep. we have all sorts. We have client service officers, we have power planners, we have advisors. One interesting thing is uh, in the early days when we we're getting advisors coming in and testing and giving feedback, we had a overwhelming, well, over-representation, I should say, of high net worth oriented businesses okay. and also uh, multidisciplinary practices with accounting arms. That's where like the demand was the greatest. And then the next yep. uh, biggest group was the um, self-licensed advisors. So they've kind of left the group land. They don't have yep. access to uh, this big research capability that they're so used to getting yep. from their licensee. And uh, it just helped them with that selection process. So um, if you're, for example, if you talk about practices where they recently became self-licensed or they're, you know, a couple of years uh, into that journey, mm. it's actually the principal advisor who wants to make sure it's the right decision around yeah. which platform they use because this is what they're going to be using for at least the next three, five, ten years, right? So you need yeah. to make that uh, decision properly. At yeah. the, um, you know, when you look at client service officers, uh, they see the tool as something where uh, if they're doing like annual reviews for clients and just validating which are the products that you should be using, they can mm-hmm. just hop on the suitability app and say, look, you're still in the best product based on your situation. So yeah, it can be used at each of those different layers. And it is something, look, we do that a lot more too in our practice where there's call it prep work done by other members of the team within all sorts of tools. And then yes, the advisor will go in, they'll check the prep work, but also then, you know, utilize the insights in terms of what then advice that's happening, or like you say, checking in um, for reviews. But I think we all probably can do more of that where we Mm -hmm. really involve the rest of the team in these things so that then they can actually do, because none of it's, you know, particularly when they're designed well, these tools aren't, you know, rocket science. They're designed to be (laughs) user-friendly. They're designed Mm -hmm. to make it easy to step through. So as long as they're trained, I think it's a wonderful idea to Uh, fold people, you know, other members of the team in. Yes, I'm a strong believer in that. In our commercial model, actually, we uh, only charge for the advisors who use the tool, but not the support staff. So if you're a business where you're just one advisor, you pay the same as if you're a business with one advisor and 10 support staff. Right. You know, so the the support staff um, get access for free because the idea is like, we don't want to dictate who in your team is doing the work. No. So you can have the flexibility to uh, run your business the way you want to run it. Nice, nice. Okay, so then the let's just do a little journey through the tool, imagining there's a, a new client we're seeing and we're considering maybe they're in some sort of 
horribilis um, product that doesn't suit them well at all. So we're looking to market and, and trying to look at alternatives for them. What's the sort of steps that then they would do if they're, you know, stepping in and getting a re- like a report done within Suitability mm-hmm. Hub? So there are, uh, I suppose, three key areas of our tool that can help. Um, the one that's more precisely aligned with your scenario is our what we call our suitability reviews. Yep. So what you can do as part of that is uh, we built a guided decision-making process. So our idea is you don't have to try to work out what's the best way of doing something. We, you can actually go through our wizard and we'll step you through three key stages to research what is the most appropriate platform. Perfect. So step one is doing the features analysis. So what you can do is you can um, go in and say, look, uh, what are the objectives of my clients? What are the things I need to serve them? What is it that they're expecting from me? And we have over 500 functionality that we assess platforms on, but they're neatly organized into 11 different groups. Okay. So you might say, all right, my client wants access, click into that area, and then specify what sort of access do they want. Do they have a you know iPhone app? Do they want an Android app? Uh, do they want awesome. to provide digital consent? Do they want to be able to initiate withdrawals themselves or trade awesome. or what have okay. you? You choose those. Um, you think about what sort of products you need to serve them. Do you want SMAs, uh, international stocks, et cetera? Yeah. So you walk through uh, our list where you choose the functionality that you need. And then we will give you a list of all the platforms in the market ranked by how many of those criteria uh, that you need each platform has okay and uh, we have a little bit of uh, uh, depth we add by enabling advisors to choose an area as essential or multiple areas as essential so any platform missing an essential feature will be highlighted in red so okay. at this point advisors make one of two decisions with each platform um, they can shortlist it and take it to the next stage of the research mm-hmm. or they can disqualify it so the nice thing about our tool is that we show every platform in the market. So a platform that um, you might not be aware of might actually be more suitable for your clients. Right. So it can highlight other products that might be more appropriate as well. Yeah. Um, but but from there, uh, if you shortlist or you disqualify a platform, you can also add comments around why did you make that decision. So you can Which say, is the breadcrumbs. For compliance. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Exactly, exactly. It comes through, it feeds through to a final report. And if you ever get audited, they can read the decision that you made. Um, the next step we walk you through is what we call the business metric analysis. So this is all the different policies and also uh, uh, you know, financial integrity style uh, metrics that we capture on platforms. So you might care mm-hmm. about, uh, is the FUA growing? Are the flows positive? What are the ESG policies? What are the data security policies? How many regulatory actions? What's the balance sheet looking like? Because not everyone might care about ESG, but they might care about data security as the, right. uh, as the alternative, right? Yeah. So again, advisors can choose the criteria that um, they care about and they believe their clients value. Um, and then they get to compare, again, among the platforms they shortlisted, which are the most suited across those criteria. They do another round of shortlisting and disqualification. So, you know, in the beginning, you might have started with 14, you shortlist five. Next stage uh, from that five, you might shortlist only three. You know, Mm. you might say, okay, two more are disqualified because of uh, reasons X, Y, Z. You can leave your comments again. Mm -hmm. And then the final piece we do is the fee analysis. So you can't get away from fee analysis. And if you think about the order I just told you, fees is the last step. Yes, And the reason fees is the last step is because if you look at fees first, you might disqualify platforms that actually have the capability that your client needs. Yeah. Right. Um, So by looking at fees last, we avoid the situation where the platform you want to use uh, might be $100 more expensive than the cheapest platform, but you can't justify why to use it. Yeah. Um, whereas this other way around, we're only looking at the platforms where we know they're going to meet your client's needs. We know they're going to align with your client's values. In yeah. the fee analysis, we take a total cost view. So mm-hmm. um, we don't just look at admin fees from platform providers, but we look at their transaction costs, um, any family fee aggregation benefits they accrue to clients, uh, cash fees, the net interest the client's going to earn on cash, okay. um, and so on. So we go quite a bit deeper 
uh, as part of the analysis, we uh, you'll know this like standard six of the code of ethics says don't just look at your client's current situation, consider their future situation as well. Mm-hmm. So we show fee projections depending on if it's an accumulator client and their balance grows, what's it going to be like okay. versus like if it's a pension client and their balance shrinks over time, how will the fees and the, the ranks of the platform based on those fees change? And, and that's powerful too, isn't it? Because there are, I can, without naming names, there's some platforms I can think of that somebody might not quite be, you know, at the top of the pops for right now, but with not very many con- contributions, they'll rapidly get into the point where that one actually makes more sense. So to be able to show that, you know, and say, look, it's not going to be long. We could make this decision now, get you set up. You're going to be all sorted. Um, and you can sort of demonstrate that that's, um, you know, that's powerful exactly. too. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, you know, no surprises, you do another round of shortlisting here, and ideally you're picking your final platform or platforms. And then at the end of the whole process, you get a neat report, which is both in a digital format, and you can download it as a, a PDF as well and save it into your CRM. And the things like our fee analysis, you can export it easily as Excel and then stick it into uh, whatever analysis or uh, document you might be presenting to a client or keeping for uh, uh, internal reference purposes. And so for the fee analysis at that point, is it down to based on the portfolio you're picking or is it using an average portfolio? How is it working that out? Yeah, yeah. So we look at the exclusively at the platform fees mm-hmm. because we wanted to. Ma- we know that not every investment is available on every platform. So what we yeah. do is make it very quick and easy to identify. All right, which platforms are going to be the most appropriate overall? Like without looking at the investment fees, mm-hmm. uh, we will soon introduce a module where you can overlay the investment fees as well. But yeah, right now to focus on about understanding those platform costs. And yep. the the fact that we look at total costs, including things like transaction fees, means that if you have a platform where they have a you know excessive brokerage on shares or they have a transaction fee on managed funds, uh, what might look cheap from an admin fee perspective later on in our research comes out as like quite expensive. Mm. So that modeling is all based on how many trades you expect in the year okay. ahead. You might say, okay. look. I'm someone who doesn't have much turnover. I'm just going to hold two ETFs. Then, you know, the the picture is very different to if you're going to hold 50 different stocks and there's a lot of turnover. And then, yeah, okay. it's, you, you know, it's, you have a couple of accounts, so all those transaction fees compound. So you could even get to the point where you might have um, having an even shorter, shorter list, um, you know, and it's narrowed down. And then if you wanted to, then you could run it through a product rex or something like that where you're putting in the detailed portfolio and you can see, because in some instances, some of the platforms have their, you know, there's fees embedded in the investment fees per investment Mm -hmm. that make the admin look pretty good. The platform looks pretty good, but once you allow for the actual cost of the investments, it can get a bit, you know, a bit high cost. And some of our users, they use the tool to build like their APL. So the practice might say, let's run it once a year and work out for retiree clients, what's the most appropriate platform or platforms for uh, high net worth clients, what's the most appropriate platform or platforms, et cetera. And then once they have established, okay, at a macro level, this is what we're going to use, they can then um, use other tools to support the decision-making or the SOA process itself. Yeah. And I'm curious then, have you seen with the people that have been, I mean, you know, it is early early days in terms of the people who have been using it, but have you found that then practices have maybe changed their um, discovery process with clients too so that they can actually then put in the answers for what the client cares about with the features? Because I'd imagine, you know, there would be um, some of those things that maybe advisors aren't asking up front. You know, they're not sort of Mm -hmm. diving into that because it was really hard to then match that because it was such a process to try and work out which providers had what. So have you found they've started changing their discovery process a bit? Yeah, so there are quite a few where after we did our training or after we did our check-in meetings, like uh, they've had this aha moment saying, look, like, I have a new uh, layer of questions I could be asking my clients do, during the fact find or financial needs analysis mm. to be more precise in my product recommendation. Because right. before, a lot of our users, like they just haven't had the tools to do this. Like even if you ask your client, how would you go and then pick a product based on oh. like, does it have a iOS app or Android right. app. Right. Oh, for Whereas, goodness sake. I've had to do that and it's really <laughs> difficult to do. 
<laughs> yeah. So, and I think one of the, there's a reticence among advisors to ask clients things where they they can kind of uh, not back it up with data yeah. afterwards through their research um, uh, process. So we actually enable you to go deeper in your client conversations and be more personal in your product recommendations. Yeah. Then you can say if a client ever says, why, why on earth did you pick this? You say, well, you told me you value A, B, and C. And guess what? Like this is the most uh, suitable product for you based on those criteria. That's very important. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And so you mentioned there were other elements. So that's the sort of suitability review. Then, mm-hmm. you know, what are the other elements that somebody would be getting access to as part of the tool? Yeah, so you can see the profiles of every platform, which means we have these uh, dedicated dashboards per platform right. that just helps you understand the full shape of their offering. Everything that you might uh, want to know. I won't say everything, 80% of what you might want to know. Because uh, there's always, like um, a few weeks ago, someone said, oh, it would be great to see the super fun and the pension USI and ABN so that we can save time when right. we do our, you know, rollover. So bang, you know, we added that as well. But the, our idea is like, uh, we want to become the one place you go to get any platform related information you might have. Nice. Our, you know, we, in that, profile section we list like the features that platforms have the business policies that they have Uh, we also go through every provider's pds and present it back in a a templated way so that you never need to read a pds again either because you know there's a lot of inconsistencies yeah (laughs) peter have you ever seen two pds's that have (laughs) they're almost impossible to read and compare that's the problem like it's really difficult to do you know it's yeah it's it's horribilous 100 so we we've done the hard yards around that and we actually uh call platform providers regularly as well and update the uh, interest rate that the clients can earn on the cash account and check if the cash fees have changed so some of these things aren't disclosed in the pds either so we make sure we just go that next layer and be are are proactive in collecting that information one of the other features that you've got to that i that i was (laughs) probably disturbingly excited about when you were talking about it but um is the sort of news and updates you know so it's because in a world of somebody being taken over by but somebody and therefore this product's being updated to that and like it's relentless trying to keep on top of that stuff so to have one place to go for that is pretty exciting too yeah the news feed um the interesting thing about it the other day is one of the advisors were talking about how their team is using it to as a training resource so that yeah. as new functionality is being released by the platform provider they can see it as part of that news feed and then um uh, say oh okay like i can get extra value or get extra efficiency out of my platform and the reality is platform providers do often email their users about like the capability yes. that comes up but peter let me ask you how many emails do you receive I, on the average I, day I, like i get hundreds a day yeah, so, you know, between the platforms, the insurers, the fund managers, like just that alone, let alone everything else. Like, yeah. we, I mean, so we, we've actually got a Slack channel where we were trying to feed all this stuff in, you know. But of course, then it's just a sc- stream of consciousness too. Whereas, that's a very good idea, <laughs> right? But, <laughs> I mean, but whereas, if we've got one place the team can go to, that then, like you say, because we like to use it as a training, you know, mm-hmm. we like a training tool too. It's the prompt. Oh, let's take a look at that. What does that mean for the business? What should we do? You know, those sort of things. It's great to just have one place you can go to for that. Yeah. And the important thing is like when you access this data, you need to be in the right mindset or yeah. mind frame. So when you get an email, it's almost like someone turning up at your door, knocking and trying yeah. to you know, say promote something or sell something or what have you. And you might value it, but you're just busy or you're in the middle yeah. of something else. So with our tool, you can just go in and say, okay, show me everything that Wealth has done in the last three months. Bang, bang, yeah. bang, bang, bang. You get all these posts around the sort of capability they have released. Yeah. And it is, uh, uh, you know, if, if any listener out there feels like they just don't run their day anymore, you know, these are the sort of things that give you back control of your time because you can just choose. I mean, even as, a, even as an advisor, you could just say, you know what, Thursday afternoons are four are when I'm going to go in and just take a look at the update you you choose you can look you'll feel up to date and like you say it's not this relentless inbox bloody attack that occurs <laughs> otherwise um if you do that can i recommend that you then start to filter your inbox um so that you're still not trying to um deal with all of those through your inbox but still it's 
I think it, it sounds like a small thing, but I think actually it will really change the way we can keep on top of all those updates because they are honestly it gets a bit ridiculous um, between all of the providers, let alone when they all merge or you know decouple or all the things that happen over time. It's very hard to keep on top of it all. Hundred percent. So then talking. So in terms of then the let's just talk the client for a second. So clearly the analysis behind the scene, evidence of analysis. Um, keeping us up to date on things like all of this is uh, very much a behind the scenes element. Is there any part of the tool that is designed to um, be either client facing or or that the people have started using to sort of show anything to the client or are you finding it's very much sort of behind the scenes that the tool lives? So we, our, our app isn't intended for the end client, Yeah, but we designed it in a way to delight advisors. And this is, uh, I, I, I actually shot myself in the foot because I used to research platforms for um, you know 11 years from 2009 to 2020. And every year I would go to every platform provider and say, hey, you have to deliver a better interface. Hey, you have to deliver better functionality, et cetera. And so when building Suitability Hub, I was very cognizant that if we didn't deliver something that's delightful to use, um, someone like Matt Heine or Jason Embersill or whoever <laughs> would grab me and say, hey, like, what's going on here? Yeah. You told us for 10 years how yeah. important a good interface yeah. is. And so a lot of, um, we, one of the first things that everyone says once we onboard them or train them is um, just the usability and the look and feel. They're very awesome. happy about it. And uh, quite a few advisors have actually said that, you know, we like the look of these charts so much that we actually end up presenting it to our clients. So okay. it wasn't our intention, intention per se. Like we wanted, um, it's a tool for advisors. It's quite hardcore. Like it's very detailed and I, I would see it as a, you know, premium research tool. Mm. But because the output looks good, like we see uh, or we hear of advisors using it with their clients. And look, like you say, it's, um, you know, with whatever may happen out of QAR, and I still don't think we know um, really clearly what's going to happen. Um, I think we'd all agree something is going to change in what gets presented to the client probably. Um, then the depth of the support research tools actually are going to become more important because we're going to need to have the things on file for us, right? We're going to need to have that that breadcrumb trial, that, you know, evidence um, that's really thorough and can demonstrate in the future because there won't necessarily be an SOA in the current form that some people use as their evidence. You know, it's like it captures everything in the SOA. Well, if that's not going to be the case anymore, exactly. you're going to have to as have a- it somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, when developing this software, like uh, that, that's been one of the big uncertainties. Like, what's going to happen with SOAs? What's going to happen with advice? Mm-hmm. What is it that you know will best interest duty still be a thing? And our mentality was, uh, let's build for a world where SOAs may not exist, and also yeah. let's be, you know work in a world where SOAs do still exist. So. Yeah. Even if, um, you, you know, once there's certainty, they come out and say, okay, you no longer have to do an SOA. Our tool will still be relevant because you yeah. can use it to say, here's the evidence. Um, you can, you know, present to a client or keep it in your record so that if you do ever get audited or questioned, um, it's crystal clear, like the difference yeah. you have around how did you reach uh, a certain decision behind why a particular practice is most appropriate. And it is something that I think... Um, some people out there might not have quite processed through is just because it's not something that's going to the client, you know, maybe a horrible 60 page SOA or whatever it is. Uh, it doesn't mean that work isn't going to occur somewhere else because Mm -hmm. we're still, you know, the SOA currently is almost like the evidence encapsulated all in one thing. Well, there's still going to be a need for that. We're still going to have to have evidence. It's just not necessarily horribilis to the client, you know, so it's just <laughs> horribilis on our file. Yay. You know, so I think um, anything that can, you know, streamline that and and also give us that I love guardrails. I love something that sort of nudges you through the process so that it's almost you'd have to try really hard not to have evidence of you know, what you're thinking and why you did this and why you did that. Like, that's fabulous um, because, you know, it's, I mean, surgeons do that. It's why they have thorough checklists. Pilots do that. They've all got mm-hmm. thorough checklists. You know, this is the way that professionals operate to make sure that, you know, we really keep on track um, all the time. So, you know, it's it's great um, to be able to have something that does that for us. I'm curious, any integration plans or does it current, you know, is your intention for the tool to integrate with any other tools in the industry? 
So uh, we don't have any integrations right now, but our idea here is to be driven by our clients. Right. So uh, because at the end of the day, you could spend a lot of time building lots of functionality that no one ends up using, right? Yes. So uh, yeah, we, we're just at that stage now where we're talking to several licensees. We, you know, we work with all the platform providers and we'll see what is it going to be like, what's going to be most effective or meaningful. Right. Um, and part of it is again, you know, what happens if, uh, you don't need to do SOAs anymore. Like what's the future of certain planning mm. software? Like do you, <laughs> and, um, I'm sure like the providers in the space will adapt, but it's just about taking the time, waiting for user feedback, and then go build from there. Purposeful yeah. building as opposed to, you know, yeah. building what you think people will want. Correct, because all of those tools are going to have to adjust too, aren't they? So you could try and integrate now, and then the thing you're going to have to integrate in the future is going to look significantly different anyway. So yeah, yeah. So our, little- our software architecture is all on microservices. That means yeah. all the different components in Suitability Hub talk to each other with APIs. Okay. When that gives us the flexibility where down the track, when we integrate, we can literally integrate any of the bits independently or all together as well. Okay. So it might be a simple matter where someone says, I just want to use this for fee analysis. Bang. You know, you plug into our fee calculator. Yeah. They might say, uh, we, you know, we just want our client details to flow in from XPAN and then the output report to go back into XPAN and then we'll yeah. build accordingly. So we've... Uh, the foundation, like we made the investments so that in the future we can do these cool integrations. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm keen to see what uh, advisors and licensees come up with. Right. Um, um, yeah, because people can get so creative. And I guess that sort of brings me to my next question is, as people have been using the tool, has there been any surprises for you of, wow, I didn't expect anybody to do that? You know, like the way they've used it or, or the insights they've gained from it? Yeah, I, I, we kind of touched on this earlier, but the fact that it's being used as a training tool is mm-hmm. something that I wasn't anticipating. So just sitting down and CSO is saying, oh, like it, it taught me what are all the things that this platform can do. <laughs> yeah. You know, so the, the, this is one of those like unintended or, you know, things you can't anticipate where it's a value add, you know, if you get, and it happens all the time, like people come from outside of the industry um, the, the, at least back in my day, there weren't that many people who were saying, I'm going to study to become a financial advisor, right? You kind of accidentally end yeah. up in this industry. So if you're, uh, you know, early in your career, if it was intentional or you had a career change, you came into the space, um, you might not know anything about platforms and what they do. So we have all that detail. You can sit down, you can learn what is the things the platform is able to do and then um, essentially get uh, uh, you know, more value out of the platforms you use, yeah. um, greater business efficiencies, better, you know, client outcomes as well, just being aware like certain uh, features and functionality exist. Yeah, for sure. And then, I mean, it's it's so new, so I feel a bit, um, I feel like I, I'm, I'm pushing hard to ask for this, but, you know, in terms of the the path forward, um, you know, there probably are some things that are already, you know, you're, you're working on um, as you roll things out. So I'm curious about that, but I'm also curious about any blue sky things that you've seen that you're like, wow, how cool mm-hmm. would it be if, if we could get that far? You know, what what's on, on that radar too? Yeah, so we um, uh, hit a big milestone a couple of weeks ago when we finally finished all our platform research functionality. Yeah. So our software is now officially live to platform providers, licensees, and advisors. Um, we have most of the platforms already using it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, with the advisors, the, we've had a great participation in our beta program, which yep. ran uh, for the last few months. So now it's about um uh you know building building the number of users there and as that happens with our software the next cap of the ranks is, is our managed accounts research yep. so we're going to bring a similar methodology where um you know existing tools might not necessarily have the granularity you need to research managed accounts be it um uh, the methodologies around RG97 or mm-hmm. The investment philosophies of the manager and so on. So uh, that's going to be our core focus in the coming months. And uh, th- there's a lot of other products out there to research as well, like industry funds, insurance, and we'll be driven by 
demand um, yeah. uh, and, and see how that goes. But lots, lots, there's a lot in the development pipeline. Perfect. And I'm imagining part of what you will have de- dealt with up to this point, and like you, I mean, you mentioned industry funds going forward, is is these groups need to be willing to give you the information you need, right, and keep it up to date. So one of your challenges, I'm imagining, is building that connection with each of these major players so that then, you know, advisors um, are getting the info they need if it's on there. You know, if it's on there, they know that at least it's, um, you know, up to date and is being fed by the provider um, and keep keeping yes, it up to date. Yes. So fortunately, a lot of the data needs to be uh, disclosed. Like there's regulation yeah. uh, that uh, managers have to comply with. So at the very least, we can get our baseline Yes. From publicly available data or just by our interpretation of, or, you know, just collecting and compiling and representing the data. And then that will put us in a, it, we already have a lot of relationships with um, key players. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the rest, like once they see some of the bigger players coming on board, like they'll um, uh, want to participate as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it is, I mean, what it, that's one of the things that I know has, has occurred for people like, say, product recs where as people were using it then of course all of the all of the platforms get more and more excited about being on there because they recognize it's part of what advisors are using as their tool so it's you know more of a sort of um taking advantage of these things and then sharing it with the the platforms we deal with and you know other funds that we deal with is going to give it give it more legs as well and of course increase the value you can deliver um and the you know the information that therefore people will provide so you know i mean spot on yeah so it's it, it, Look, and, and I'm empathetic to that. Any of us who have had to deal with data feeds alone uh, will understand how painful this stuff can be <laughs> uh, between the providers. So, you know, I don't envy you the work that you and your team do. But um, is there anything else that we've missed? Any key areas we haven't covered? I, I feel it's been very comprehensive. So, so, yeah. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, this is an industry that I personally love and I want to support. And uh, my hope is that through Suitability Hub, we can help more advisors better serve their clients. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. All right, Advice Explorers. If you'd like to find out more about Suitability Hub, then the website link is in the episode show notes. I've I've included uh, Rajip's uh, LinkedIn details as well. So I'm sure he's happy for you to link, uh, you know, reach out to him and he'll point you in the right direction. Thank you so much for joining us here today, hearing about Suitability Hub being live and, and happening. And I'm so excited of how much detail we can dig into all the nitty gritty of platforms going fu- going into the future. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Peter. It's been great. All righty. So, look, I'm betting that most of you listening are not users of su- su- Suitability Hub. Woo! Sorry, that was a struggle to get my tongue around. Uh, primarily because when this episode goes live, they've literally just gone to market in a fuller sense. They have had people beta testing up to that point. So maybe you were one of the people that they used to get feedback um, on the tool from and kudos for you to agreeing to do that. Um, but anybody who has been playing with the tool, head over onto the Ensemble platform and share with people how you've gone, you know, how has it changed your process, what have you been using it for. Um, you know, it's it's really powerful to share how we find these as we come across these new tools, how we find them. So it's important that we sort of give our fellow advisors a heads up. Now, in terms of my thoughts, you know, the power of these tools, it's so interesting because um, for many of us, we have to go to a lot of places to get the information we need. And, uh, you know, that can be a struggle and it can take a lot of time and it can mean we end up doing a lot of um, digging and researching for information that we know is there, but we've got to find it. Um, whereas for, you know, having a tool like this, um, then it means if that's in one place, that can just streamline that process. It also means, hey, if you've been thinking about, you know, working on your investment philosophy and we've got, you know, Ensemble's got some great tools to assist with that. Well, this is like, you know, to support you in your platform philosophy. You know, you're going to have these things at your fingertips. You're going to be able to have an approach because you've got the research there to dive into. Um, And the concept of being able to match what a client might expect or need to what we recommend is exciting, to be honest, because for a long time, for example, you know, advisors haven't been able to ask deep ESG style questions because we would struggle struggle to match it in a recommendation. Of course, now there's all sorts of ways we can do that and there's all sorts of tools that can help. Well, in this instance, there's all there's now richer and deeper 
um, conversations with we can have with clients about how they like their platform, how they want to interact with it, you know, the sort of values they want the platform to have. Now, you know, with tools like Suitability Hub, we'll be able to then match that. We'll have a tool that will help us match that. So I'm, I, you know, the more of these that are there where it's all in one place, gee, that's exciting, you know, um, and the team there are really focused on making this as easy as possible. The other thing that's interesting for me is anything that brings some rigor to both our research, but our evidence of our research process, you know, going forward, my hot tip no matter what happens with QAR is the evidence of our work is the thing we need to focus on. We need to sort of really make sure that that's as, as strong um, and as as detailed and thorough as we can make it. So any of these tools that do that, you know, then more power to them. Um, now, what we didn't actually manage to cover was should you check out Suitability Hub and you figure that's something that can really add some value to the practice um, or your work as an advisor, then for people who do um, join uh, as a user, then you'll get access to their most recent, and we're talking like literally just now, 2024 platform market wrap report. And they've really bothered to look at what each platform are doing, what they're going to be working on going forward, where they're heading, where their focus is, who's their niche, who's their, like they're sort of giving us that side by side work um, that, you know, a lot of us have had to do historically by just meeting with a whole lot of BDMs, right? So, um, you know, that'll be something you'll get access to as if you um, decide to become a user of the tool as well. So I think that can be really valuable if you want to bring some rigor to your platform selection process. All righty. Now, as you know, there's only one skill you need to become a bionic advisors, and that is avid curiosity. Now, to help you build that habit, today's Curiosity Corner website that I'd love you to check it out is called Gummy Search. And yes, gummy as in gummy bear. So you can find that at G-U-M-M-Y search.com. Now, Gummy Search is basically something that sits over Reddit. So it's an audience research tool for Reddit. So you can search pain points, you can search what solutions people are looking for, content ideas, for example, what are the questions that come up a lot. Um, you can even interact with people. And what was interesting to me when I took a look at this, you know, we're focusing on a niche um, that we're going to be really working with closely going forward. I want to deeply understand what their needs are. Would you believe when I scrolled through Gummy Search's tools and, and what they can provide, they said, oh, you know, you can peek into conversations based on some key categories. And let me just read out for you the key categories they had. Pain points, solution requests, hot discussions, seeking alter- alternatives, and money talk. Money talk even has its own category on this tool. So, you know, I think to be able to witness um, what people are talking about, what they're asking, what they're struggling with, hey, this could be really powerful. So if you want to be able to really discover the voice of your consumer, who you're trying to help, um, and in their language, you know, how powerful is it to be able to get um, what they're dealing with in their words, uh, then this just might be worth checking out. Um, It's Gummy Search. I'm certainly having a good dig to see what value it can bring to me, um, and it might just help you out in any of your marketing or otherwise maybe program building that you're doing in the future. Well, that's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. Now, we are super rapidly coming up to March and International Women's Day, and I have mentioned before, I've now got mm, some pretty narrow slots available for International Women's Day events. Um, You know, whether that be a keynote or even a workshop, um, then I do have something that takes advantage of all the wonderful you know, noise out there that's going on with Taylor Swift and her visit um, uses her and the music industry as a great analogy for the gap between the wonderful product that or production that women contribute into industry versus the economic decisions that they can contribute to. So, um, you know, this is, yes, it is about insight and industry, but I bring it back to financial literacy. So if that is something that you'd like to chat to me about, you might have even a smaller group, you'd like to have a session to, um, you know, lean into the messaging of economic empowerment for this International Women's Day, then please just reach out to me on LinkedIn that's forward slash Peter MD. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious. Stay curious.